Well, good afternoon or whatever time of day it may be, <laughs> where, you, where you live. Um, I want to start with, a. have been speaking a little bit about why I'm doing these talks the way I am, and I'm going to give hopefully a condensed version of that. I um, was a practicing EA astrologer for about 12 years. And um, my life started changing. And it's interesting because I feel like I ingested the work of EA. And as I applied it in my own life, my own life began changed, was continually changing. And so it's led me in my own healing. I will preface my talk on Chiron on the healing journey that I have Chiron uh, two degrees into my first house. So this is why I get to talk about Chiron. Um, I have lived it. And that is a hint of where we're going with this because to me, Chiron is an experiential um, topic or experience. And, you know, granted mine's in the first house, so it's experiential, but I feel like all Chiron is experiential. And then the question becomes, well, why do we have this? Not Chiron, but why does it correlate to our wounds? And the next question is, why do we have all these wounds? What is the reason for all the wounds? Um, so I'm going to get to that shortly. So as my experiences have changed, my life has been changing. Uh, I feel like I have been integrating. And I began running or being exposed to different ways of looking at the experiences that have occurred and continue occurring in my life. I had a certain frame on it. Um, a very common frame in our world, in our reality. Uh, somewhat of a linear sense of reality where on a from a spiritual perspective of a long sequence of lifetimes, um, some of which are, you know, a lot was accomplished and others not so much was accomplished and some maybe backslid and all these people that I had done various things to, which was why I had <laughs> to have painful experiences and, uh, you know, we're familiar with that orientation. Now, none of what I'm about to say is implies in any way that if you live in certain ways or never have a negative thought and always have positive thoughts and you're kind and loving to everyone, that you're going to have this peachy, amazing life without pain and loneliness and uh, things won't go wrong and you won't suffer. No, I mean, it's, it's not like that. It's more like changing our relationship to the experiences that occur. We tend to view things that are fun and uplifting and exciting as good, and things that are painful or stressful or drawn out or difficult as bad. And that's where we start. Because the gist of it, and another way of looking at it is, what if life is totally on my side from my first breath? And that everything that occurs to me is part of my evolution and here to serve and help me. Now, granted, we have certain kinds of experiences and it's not always easy to see, well, how is that helping me? 
but it's more of a long-term thing. I address this, uh, I, f I find at this point, most of the people who come to my particular talks, no, no reflection whatsoever on anyone else's, but because of what I talk about, tend to be people that have a strong spiritual orientation. They're already aware of that. And as I move along and as my life is changing and my attitudes are changing, and I find myself moving into spaces, you know, I like to say, I, I grew up in New Jersey. And um, it's, a, it's a rough place and we don't gather fools lightly. And um, so many concepts that um, I, to some extent, used to perhaps be skeptical about, poo poo a little bit and so forth. Uh, you know, a little too new agey, a little too much white light. I'm finding more and more validity to certain perspectives. Perhaps not, perhaps the way they are expressed and manifested may be a little airy or hopeful or, uh, you know, idealistic whatever, but that the gist of it, that there's a great deal of truth. So I find the people, um, backtrack. So at this point in my life, I can take the term that goes around, that's called light worker, which I used to be a little skeptical about, and say, yes, that's me. I'm a light worker. Jeffrey used to call it soul worker, which I feel like it's the same thing. And either term is fine, light worker is more in use. What is the light worker? Somebody who works with the light. What does that mean? I feel like we are all here, those of us that resonate with what I'm talking about, we are all here specifically to help ground the new energies that are coming to this planet. They're already here. And as we look around, as we see the stuff that's going on right now, particularly intense, on our TV every day, um, it's not too difficult to be thinking about, so where's all the light? Because we're seeing a lot of occurrences that seem unfair, unjust, um, I would say old. And I thought we had gone beyond this. I spent my whole life working for this, really. Thought we'd gone behind beyond this, and it seems like we're sort of back where we were in some ways. And um, those are valid feelings, I feel. I mean, they're fears and uh, anger and so forth and they have their place for sure but I see them as part of the transition that's going on the energy the vibration on this planet is going up it is going up it's already gone up and I feel that is why we have so much turmoil going on because the energy's already gone up and a lot of the people, perhaps the majority of the people don't realize this. And they're trying to sustain what has been and it no longer works. It's no longer working the way it used to because the time for a lot of these things is over. And we can hang, uh, we can try to hang on to them and, you know, for me, one of the things I'm learning is instead of being angry about the injustice and uh, the people that seem to uh, relish in it and prosper from it and so forth. In my realization, we're all divine, including people who the last thing they would identify with is my idea of what being divine means or looks like and yet 
these are wounded souls. They're souls that have experienced a lot of pain. And believe me, I get as, ang as angry about it as, as anyone else does. But as I'm changing my attitude and my relationship with myself, I realize that isn't really going to resolve things. You know, what if we need the chaos, the calamity on the planet to instigate, to be the source, to create the crisis, crises, out of which the changes will come in the physical reality, in the physical circumstances. And from our perspective, identified with personality, they can be very painful. Um, so my point with Chiron is I, I take the um, interpretation of Chiron as wounded healer as a pretty reasonable um, way of looking at Chiron. Now, you know, in EA, we talk about Chiron represents our deepest wounds. Well, our deepest wounds would be closest to our heart and soul, right? That's why they're so deep. So the healing that occurs, when it occurs, is extremely transformative. I happen to have Chiron and Sag, and as I said, it's right on my ascendant. Um, we equate Sag with indigenous and intuition and right brain and all this, um, which also, well, it represents indigenous and out of these cultures you have what we call shamans. Uh, speaking about the um, <laughs> original shamans, not so much the ones that have master's degree in shamanism. That's okay too, in the modern time it has its place. But I'm speaking about it at this moment. In terms of what did the shamans represent, I've not deeply studied this, so I'm giving my uh, understanding what's what's come to me and what I've ingested from others who have studied with such people. That basically in the cultures that quote believe in this phenomenon, that there are certain people that have marked emotional disturbances from early on in life. And they recognize the symptoms or the so signs is a better word, the signs of this. And the elders, the wise people, are trained and know how to locate people who are being born who have these qualities and to train them for their role. And they're having out-of-body experiences, psychic experiences, um, you know, dealing with uh, non-incarnated entities, all, all all of this. And as they gradually learn how to, and, and, the, and, the, and they all tend to be very sensitive. They tend to be very sensitive. People who resonate with this, we tend to be very sensitive. And as um, we have found out, much of our world does not honor, understand, or relate to uh, deep sensitivity. And I say a lot of the wounds, the wounding has come out of that. Now, so the shamans learn how to work with these energies and it's experiential. They have had the experiences. The way I've described this, not that um, if I were to go to Nepal, I might hire um, a Sherpa instead of walking around myself. What's a Sherpa? I'm not saying they're shamans, but what's a Sherpa? 
It's somebody that knows the terrain. Because they know the terrain, they are qualified internally to guide others in the terrain. And that is the way I look at shamanism and it's the way I look at Chiron. As we learn our Chironic lessons, we become qualified to assist, to guide others who are stumbling around self-defined stumbling around in the terrain because to be qualified means we have found our way it doesn't mean we're completely healed it doesn't mean yeah it doesn't mean we're completely healed and it doesn't mean we have to be completely healed before we are qualified to assist others it's it's an internal process and it's self-selecting. Um, so I view that as the why behind Chiron. Um, all human beings, we all have a Chiron. We all have deep wounds. I'm gonna backtrack for a moment. Because the light workers, as I was talking about, I am really clear. Um, those who are in that grouping, in other words, it's a reason for incarnating. We're not here to fit in in the normal way. When I encounter people like this, uh, many of us have tried to fit in and it doesn't really work. There's a tendency with that being a sensitive person to start thinking about what's wrong with me that I can't do what other people do and feel happy doing it. So don't, you know, to make it brief, what if that's not why I'm here? What if that's not why you're here? Now we don't necessarily have a place in the society, the society doesn't necessarily value um, those of us who are attuned to where things are going. What if there's a whole bunch of us that came here wanting with the motivation, with the intention, wanting to assist in the transformation of the planet? What if we agreed to come in here uh, in order to be here, you have to be born. Um, <laughs> the way I, I look at it, 90% uh, humorous, but also me ser you know, meaning it. The number of people on this planet that were born into dysfunctional families is somewhere around 7 billion, I would say, which is pretty much everybody. Um, and if somebody was lucky enough to be born into a family that was relatively functional, most likely the parents or elders in that situation themselves had healed a lot of the dysfunction that they came out of. Because that has been the state of our planet. Is this because we're all a bunch of negative creeps who disobey God and do bad things or are too weak to stand up? I don't think so. If everybody is doing it, has done it, it can't <laughs> really be an accident unless <laughs> it's a prison, it's a penitentiary, which I don't believe this is so. Um, I think that we are, are all here ultimately wanting to wake up and, and working to wake up. Many of us are here unconsciously not realizing that's what we're doing. And many of us, well, not so much people that would listen to this, but I'm talking about around us. Many are people who, if you tell them that's why they were here, would poo-poo you, you know, it's not me. Um, and that's fine. That And it's not you know, it's not about converting them, changing them, making them see it. The gist of it is 
waking up, I am clear, is an inner process. It's motivated from within. Um, it comes from the soul. And not everyone who is here at this time is here for the first big wave of the shifts that are coming. Those of us that are, are in a minority at this point, which is fine, it's supposed to be that way. But we are like seeds that are anchoring light, anchoring love, anchoring a different perspective, anchoring something that's new. And that's where I am coming to, you know, like my, uh, what is it, my, um, how do I put this? My moment of vulnerability, I'll say it that way. You know, I have not been, I have been um, tending to, I wouldn't say I've been running around in a state of depression, but I would say I have tended to be put back by all of the, um, uh, injustice, what, what seems to me injustice, cruelty, insensitivity, uh, unawareness around me lifelong, which is, you know, which I have had a lot of anger about why is the world the way it is? Why are people the way they are? And I have not been um, a super optimistic person in the short run, in the short term. I feel like I am in the long term, but in the short term, not so much. And, you know, I find this changing in myself, which is very interesting to watch. As I step back and see, um, I step back and see um, the, um, the reasons for this, what we need, a, <clears throat> a, a reframe. <clears throat> this very idea of um, bad karma and, but let me put it at the core. The root problem or issue that I see is that mm, the majority of us, from my perspective, have grown up and developed um, self images that are critical, doubtful, unappreciative of self, feeling like not being enough, not doing things right, um, uh, not being kind enough, not being happy enough, not being too angry, uh, all of these type of feelings which go around and around in a circle, which is basically putting self down. And the majority of people came out of families where different permutations of that were the prevailing mindset. Now, Part of what has been changing for me is realizing that um, in choosing to come here, you need to be born in a family. And if the great majority of families are dysfunctional from um, an emotional place of emotional and spiritual health, then you're very likely to be born into that sort of family. So the eye opener for me um, is in the realization of what, and, and, and we imprint that conditioning. We learn through the reward and punishment system as a child. Children, you know, want love. Children have fear of being abandoned. They're not going to be able to take care of themselves past, past a certain point. They're not, it's not intended that way. 
And so we want love, we want safety, we want security, and we learn from parents, family, school, peers, um, later work, friends. How do I have to show up in order to get that um, approval, that sense of worth? The point in that is if you look at it, it's an external sense of validation. We're looking for other people to tell us we're doing good. I love you. You're great. You're, you're amazing. And so what do I have to do? How do I have to show up in order to get that kind of feedback? What parts of myself do I learn to hide away? Because they, do, they, get, they draw the opposite of that kind of feedback. And yet, these are parts of myself. And I am not being kind to them. I am being judgmental of them. Steve? We grow up and we learn these. No. That's okay. We just lost you for a few seconds. Uh, you can just continue. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Okay. Um, we learn how to present ourselves to get the approval, love, and validation that we need. Now, this, this becomes... Uh, you know, this easily gets into codependency, mutual dependency. I wanted to, I wanted to say, by the way, um, along the lines of what I'm talking about, because a part of this is I don't, I used to follow the transits pretty closely. I don't follow them as closely anymore. Um, when I looked at today, I found, uh, you know, this is why perhaps I don't need I don't feel the need to follow transits extremely closely because Linda set up these dates with me some months ago. And as it turns out, here I am giving this talk. And today is the day that the sun is at 25 degrees Libra, which is the exact degree of my south node. So I was like, you know, who writes this stuff? My point with it is not that there's not value in astrology. It was reassuring for me to see that. But my, my point with it is we are intuitively on track. We're intuitively on track. We're intuitively guided. And astrology is good because it helps validate and helps point out what's coming up ahead in the road. And there's a lot of value in that. But more and more I see the root or the core needs to be in my relationship with myself, my deepest self, my soul. And um, In the healing that's going on, the healing that needs to go on is self-love, self-appreciation, self-acceptance. The way I've, I've been um, focusing recently on a principle that was new to me that I have, I'm finding is pretty amazing. And it is that um, our nervous systems, which are what are affected, you know, sensitive people have sensitive nervous systems, which are affected by trauma, which are affected, which are the root of triggering and so forth. Our personality, our bodies are really trying to serve and protect us they're doing the best that they know how. And um, 
The interesting principle is that to the subconscious mind, which is our inner guardian of, of our physical existence, what it feels safe with is what is known and familiar. What is new and unfamiliar feels scary and not safe. And the more that I have um, observed that going on in my own life lately, the, m the more profound I see that that is. We hear about people, for example, that grew up in a home, children who grew up in a home with um, incest or sexual abuse. They tend to find themselves getting attracted to similar situations in their adult life. And, you know, I began to understand that because even though it's crazy to grow up that way, even though, which I, I didn't, even though it's crazy, even though you wouldn't wish it on anyone, it's familiar. It's familiar. Now the gist of growth and of life is it's continually moving us along. Things finish, things end. That's the nature of cycles. Um, you know, Saturn cycles, uh, lunar cycles, lunar nodal returns, things like that. But it's change. And we, our nervous systems for, I'd say the majority of people don't feel safe or comfortable with a lot of change. We get afraid, uh, we get worried, and sometimes we double down. And the root of this is because we have experienced from our perceptions, from our perspectives, um, that life is not necessarily on my side, that I need to be afraid, that I need to worry, that I need to um, hold on to things, and that things may not work out well if I don't try to be in charge and control what's going on. Where, when and where you have a lot of wounds in your chart, those, that's places where that's gonna occur. I'll, I'll um, throw in here that I'm feeling more and more for what I'm calling light worker type people that a lot of our fear of being seen, of speaking out, um, is based on subconscious memory of having been persecuted. Um, and uh, rejected, uh, abandoned, and so forth from the past. I was thinking with this um, man, the reporter who, the Saudi Arabian guy who um, was murdered evidently by that, by that government, was like, well, that guy's you know, going to be reborn. He's, he was speaking out. He was speaking out for reform in a country where they're actually moving in the other direction uh, to quite an extent. And uh, so what is the subconscious imprint with this? Taking it into a next life. I spoke out. I mean, some people are courageous and they'll do it anyway. That's, that's courageous and that's a courage. Right. Many of us, I feel, um, have certain fears about being seen and heard, relating back to um, experiences of being persecuted. Now, one of the other places that I'm learning in my own life is I found a certain almost unconscious um, perspective or tendency in a lot 
of EA and the way that it was presented of um, how you have to push yourself to go to your north node and get away from your south node and um, you know the, the kind of like we're lazy and we need to really work work this and I used, I used to teach that actually and and practice it and there's something to it but I also think it covers over a lot of self neglect and self denial um, because there's an underlying message there that if I don't if I'm not really paying attention and you know and really kind of putting the spurs to myself a lot of the time that I'm just going to goof off or mess up or what I call, you know, miss, <laughs> miss, miss my purpose, which I don't believe is really possible. But um, so what I'm learning, which is not to negate the way that we were taught it, but perhaps to make it gentler, is the realization that everything that I need to do in my script for this life is unfolding at exactly the time that it's intended to unfold. And if I was unable, you know, to make this giant leap opportunity that was presented to me, if had that occurred, if that occurs, um, it's not that I screwed up or chickened out. What if I'm just not ready to do that yet? It would, that it would be traumatizing. What if that's something that's going to occur in the future? And the way I'm feeling now is very much preparing for what's coming. This is the way that I'm learning to look at myself and um, to talk to others. Because I think we have, I don't think we have enough of that in, in our world of validating and honoring where I already am. Um, yeah, so the same with, the same with, uh, in terms of Chiron and its wounds, it's inherent in the chart that, uh, healing is going to occur. Is it total healing? Whatever that means, probably not. Is it progressive, ongoing, incremental healing with deepening? Absolutely. And it has been going on. If I was, a, quote, avoiding it or not consciously avoiding it, but if I was missing it early on, why would, it, why would I miss it early on? In my case, I felt so um, unworthy and messed up in myself. I didn't feel that uh, when, that, when the wounds started coming up, I couldn't bear feeling them. Uh, shut down, I get defensive, I push back on the person. Um, we're seeing a lot of that in the political realm right now, in my opinion. That's why, that's why. As I have more self-love, self-appreciation, and more understanding of this whole process, I am better able to hold the parts of myself that don't feel good about myself the feelings that come up that we don't like, whether it's anger, um, you know, fear of failure, fear of inadequacy, unworthiness, all that, all of that. They're just parts of me, they're, they're shadow parts. And <clears throat> I, I think what a lot of what's happening in the world right now with me too, and other things is the shadow is coming up and it's not in the short term in the uh, mainstream frame of mind 
it can be, you know, those the men need to own all this stuff. And, that, and I 100% agree. But condemning people, I see, is not the way that very many people are going to grow or change. Because a lot of the reasons people are acting out, we are acting out as we do in whatever way, from shutting down to, you know, being a sexual predator, whatever, um, really relates to what's going on inside underneath that. Where are my holes? Where, where are the holes in my love for myself first? Why do I feel like I need to dominate? I, I don't, I'm saying for people who do. Why do I feel like I need to dominate the planet to be a billionaire, trillionaire, um, you know, how, you know, uh, being able to sleep with any woman that comes along because I can. Why do, why even have a need for this? There's clearly a lot of hurt, holes and wounds beneath this. I'm not saying it excuses one iota of the behavior. It doesn't. But what I'm saying is long, and, and, and a lot of those people are unlikely to have a huge amount of healing in this life. And for some who do, if they do, awesome. I am so for it. What I can work on is myself. I have been working on myself, um, and by the working on, I'm, I don't even like that phrasing anymore. I have been learning to love myself and honor myself. And lo and behold, out of that, because I've been very low key for three or four years, and out of that, I'm still invited to talk on an internet astrology talk that people around the world watch, not hundreds of them, but they are interested in what I have to say. And my point with that is, if we are, the work that we're doing, the changes that we're going through are of value to others. And I add to this that the greatest change that is going on in me and that has happened in my entire life is learning how to love, honor, and nurture myself. And to me, long-term, that is the healing that will ultimately bring healing to the whole planet. And that's why I keep talking about this particular subject and different permutations of it, because I feel the more that I can, I don't light a spark I, in others. I feel like I validate sparks that others are already feeling, that they're not clear or certain of what to do with or how to bring forth, or if it's even right to bring forth, or am I a little crazy? And I am 100% clear at this point in my life that anyone that is feeling that is 0% crazy. I've uh, dealt with a lot of that myself. And it comes down to a meaning, purpose, and reason for being here that we know within because it's our sole reason. And as I wrote, um, what if Chiron and Deep Wounds represent opportunity rather than burden and gifts and strengths rather than weaknesses and shortcomings? And that is exactly where I see that principle playing out. Because the wounds that have occurred in me have caused me, made it necessity for me to delve deep within in order to um, in order to sustain trying out many different things in, in many spheres of life you know some of which well they were all necessary and valuable 
Um, for the most part, I've been not so much in the mainstream. I've had, I've had, uh, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm around the perimeters. Um, and that, and that works for me. So for me, what I've learned from that is there are many people that would like to be, that are in the mainstream because that's where they wound up or they for many reasons. And they would like to be a little less in the mainstream and it's scary. It is scary and I've been through it. Um, and to validate that. And more and more what I see is life, when, when I'm feeling, when any of us are feeling a strong call uh, or draw to an inner perspective, that is life showing us, guiding us to where I'm supposed to be, you're supposed to be. More and more I see we have seven billion approximately human souls on this planet and no two of them, no two of them are remotely alike. Each of us is completely unique and that is divinity. We may occasionally meet somebody who's similar, but in terms of the essence of each of us, it is unique. And each of us from our uniqueness has a part, a role to play in the unfolding and awakening that's going on. And nobody can play my part and my role. And further, I see, it doesn't matter how big or small my part is. I may think that I, you know, need to be on a stage with 3,000 people listening to me to be doing something that's significant. But I am realizing my sitting on my couch and sitting in a state of honoring and loving myself is, con is a big contribution to the planet Earth and to its growth. Because there are many of us that are in this space. We're not doing this alone. But we each have a unique way and role. And some people have bigger parts. And some people what appear to be bigger parts. And some people have smaller parts. But in reality, from the greater perspective, all parts are equal. Everyone is simply doing what they feel called to do. For me, I've had to take, um, I've had to make it okay to have, I, I was already for a number of years, a lot more low key than I had been previously. And the last few years has been almost thoroughly inner transition which has um, kept me very, very quiet and at home m most of the majority of the time. And, uh, you know, I felt weird or strange about that at times, but I've gotten clear. There's a lot shifting on the inside and it's just as much effort. I don't like the word effort, it's just, it takes just as much concentration to do inner and commitment to do interchange as it does to do, to, to manifest in the outer in, in a ways large and small. And that also it's a matter of timing. There's a timing for all things. Everything, I'm clear, anything and everything that any of us can imagine, think, feel. Um, well, I would like to do that, you know, or I want to do this, or I want to have, I want to get this going, or this or that. That's not, ne that will come to pass. And it's not necessarily something that's in the script in the current life. And it doesn't mean it isn't either. But anything that I feel that I'm drawn to that I'm passionate about either has occurred or is occurring or will occur. 
Therefore, I don't have to drive myself to do more than I feel relaxed and self-nurturing and self-caring to do. Because it's all going to happen at the appropriate time. That's a huge, uh, that's a huge load. <laughs> that's a huge load off the back. Are we, what time do we go to, Linda? 3.15? And uh, the second session, I'll, I'll do the, the uh, charts and, the, and uh, I would offer that we have um, a Q&A session and uh, or it'll be a Q&O because it'll be question and opinion. <laughs> Mine. <laughs> And um, they don't necessarily have to be about Chiron and the healing journey. Uh, so we can talk about, well, I'll, t I'll mention this when we get started, but we can talk about any kind of EA questions or topics or comments on the approach that I have been laying out. Um, let me see. I'm gonna... So to tie all of this together, Imagine starting to look at things from the perspective that there is nothing wrong. I've done nothing wrong. I can't do anything wrong. Everything I do is okay. I learn something from everything I do. It would be fair to say, um, well, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do it that same way again. We can assume, I assume, whatever I'm doing or someone else is doing, they're doing the best that they're able to do at that particular moment. Therefore, I don't, you know, I mean, Shame, I've talked before about shame. Shame is a um, very pervasive, pervasive emotion from our cultural conditioning. Uh, shame is based on, I, I've done it wrong, being told I've done it wrong, uh, even being laughed at for how naive or, or silly or, uh, done. So um, this is about healing shame. If I can't do anything wrong, then there's no real basis for shame. That doesn't make it go away. But one thing that I'm realizing is I can own the shamed parts of myself. I can allow myself to feel. That's one of my least favorite feelings. I, you know, I have <laughs> verbally attacked people rather than wanting to feel my own shame because it, I feel so bad about myself from it. As I, in moving to the perspective that I can't really do anything wrong then there's no real basis for shame. Then I don't have to feel shame that I have shame. That's a starting point. Because if I can become not ashamed of my shame, I can hold my shame. And with some of these emotions, which definitely come out of childhood, it becomes, okay, the shame, because it's a very young part, a child part. So what is it that you need that you didn't get? What is it that you need that you didn't get? And sometimes this way of looking at things can just cause spontaneous breaking down in tears or a tear or many tears or anger arising. And that's to me key to the healing because what is coming up is part of our deepest wounds. And that's the healing of Chiron is from holding, learning how to hold that wound, not reject it, 
not abandon it, not being afraid of it, but to hold it and honor it for what it is and what it, and what it has been through and what it has survived. So um, let's pause there. Thank you for, for, and for, for anybody who's not coming back for session two. Thank you for joining me on session one. And for those of you that are coming back, we'll start again in 15 minutes. Okay, go ahead. Okay, where are we starting? Linda? Okay. So welcome back to part two of Chiron and the Healing Journey. And I have a question from Delphine about the meaning of a Chiron return. She has Chiron retro at Aries six degrees. Um, very interesting. I had my car on return uh, a year or so before I started seriously studying astrology. And uh, I was on a spiritual path for a long time, blah, blah. And um, I, was, I, was, I was 50 and I was walking around in the summer when I was 50 going, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm suddenly wise. <laughs> I just know things. I don't know how this happened. Um, a year or so later, I learned about Chiron and, and the Chiron return, and I very much equated the experience I had with the Chiron return. <clears throat> and the way I would put it is, in the realm, this is my opinion, in the realm of where the Chiron wounds are located, in your case, they're in the eighth house, uh, which is going to be in some deep places, emotionally, um, in Aries, which I would say in a lot of cases has a dual effect of kind of dampening one's Mars intense. In other words, I don't feel safe to actualize or activate. And at the same time, that can also create a subconscious anger about it occurring. That's my 10 second look at, at that. Um, the way I look at it, having gone through 50 years of the cycle, you've seen it all in the Zodiac. You've had all the experiences that can occur with the transit of it. The second time around, I find it, it's more like, okay, well, I'm better prepared now. I'm more conscious, I'm more aware of what's coming up because I've seen it before. And um, especially when we're younger, you can't make as many conscious choices because you literally don't have the room or the space to do it. Being 50 years old, you now can make conscious choices. Um, here's that situation coming around again. Okay, I remember what happened last time. I'm gonna, here's how I'm gonna approach that now. Uh, in a nutshell, that's what I would say. There's a, a wisdom learned from the wounds of the wounded healer that have experienced res re resolve and healing because many of them have. It's another shot. I also find on the second go around, there's more space. Um, the wisdom gained can show up being of value to others. Melanie, are you there? Let's go hey guys, I am. Oh, okay. I am here. Sorry. Um, 
It's weird the audio just cut out for a minute, and then you were asking for me, so uh, I'm sorry that I missed that. If you could uh, move back from your computer a little bit, you're coming through very loud. Um, um, okay, so me. Steve, what did you want to talk about with Melanie? Well, it's more the other way around. <laughs> well, I'll tell you that everything that you've been saying is just so beautifully resonant for me in the way that I've already been experiencing these aspects in my chart. And, um, and earlier on, you were talking about sometimes difficult things uh, paving the way for necessary change. You were talking about that on a societal level. But for me, I'll tell you that, you know, I, I know that squares get a, a bad rep in astrology sometimes. Um, but I just, this, this square that I have in my chart between Chiron and Uranus and my nodes have just been a godsend for me. Um, it's, for me, it creates at all times, like, the right amount of friction Yes. to constantly like um to constantly build and progress you know like i don't get totally comfortable but at the same time um when i'm in the flow with what show is up then i don't have to um make all of these i don't have to constantly adjust my thinking i just keep myself open and let these squares continue to work on me um and they show me where to go if you're paying attention and they've taken me some amazing places and sometimes I think of that friction as, you know, how like the plates rubbing together in the earth is what builds mountains, you know, and you build up that mountain and from the peak, you get a, a beautiful view. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but the Chiron, especially, um, and seeing how my relationship to, to that has shifted, shifted, there's been some that one's resolved through my south node. So there's been some early life relive dynamics with that. And, um, and that came in the form of, in my environment, my sensitivities um, really developed around needing to read the energy of the room and the people in it, making sure that they were taken care of so that I, could, I would feel safe. I, I grew up in a, a household where there was violence. And, um, and so it was just my worth, what was felt like was kind of taught to me, it was my worth was how I could serve others would be of use to them. And if I wasn't useful to them, then I felt like I was at danger or at, at risk in some way. Um, and that's, you know, in keeping with my, my Uranus and Scorpio just across the, across the court there from Chiron in the sixth, you know? Um, yes. And so there was a little bit of risk of violence and danger for me that caused me to, to really need to be sensitive and hone those gifts. But over time, that relationship has shifted into knowing that my use of those um, sensitivities is meant to serve so much better than just to um, to become be of use to my abusers. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, and so then it's a matter of like getting to higher and higher vantage points with that friction that all those the, the square continues to provide for me it's constantly lifting me up and above to higher and higher vantage points where um i feel like it's it's leading me into a place where i can hopefully make a contribution on a on a global scale yes and i yes, yes. i didn't talk about it but um I started touching on family lineages and we can really look at it that as healers, Chiron is a healer. Everybody has Chiron. Mm -hmm. um, as healers, we are also part of our work is healing, not the people in our lineage, but through healing ourselves, we are affecting psychically the energy fields of those in the lineage, mm -hmm. whether they consciously recognize it or not. And that's part Absol of part of the deal that we took on. And Absolutely. By cleaning out a, or healing a lineage, you know, millions of people healing millions of lineages over time, we start changing the energy, collective energy on the planet. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is going on. 
and Absolutely. we are part of this healing. And it's awesome. I, I love what you said. Um, it's very much so, you know, I've, I, I haven't really had an impetus to write an astrology book, but I realized a long time ago, if I, if I wrote a book, one of my potential titles was Transits Are Your Friends. Um, <laughs> everything that occurs, pleasant and unpleasant, is helping us. And I look at it sometimes, I used to say it about Saturn, but uh, I, think it, I think I would apply it to squares also. That I, I used to say it about Saturn transits, or as, Saturn aspects. Um, that Saturn is like the good friend you have that's willing to tell you the truth. <laughs> Not in a loaded way, just... The, the friend that tells you the truth that other people won't say because you might not want to hear it. And they're not judging. It's not judgmental at all. It's just simply, hey, here's what's going on. And I, I would say squares or, or um, you know, other uh, more difficult transits. Similarly, they are, they are guiding us or almost like, almost like a parent in a way. They're showing us where we're going next as we continually expand we heal we expand we then the cycle then we didn't get into but the cycle of letting go the end of a cycle you know but I, that's why i love phases and cycles because of the cyclic nature because there's a it's death rebirth and things die because they've served their useful purpose in our life. We have grown from what goes out of our life. It's, I look at it as a graduation sign. So to have, um, you know, also that you've, I, I see that you have it square, um, your, your nodes. And so that's also another healing that's going on. Um, of the, uh, I related all the trauma now, you know, 11th house, Pluto. I related all, all to trauma now, the experiences that we've had and the healing, the healings of the trauma through the self nurture and through, even in a family situation, you love the people and reaching a point where it's like, it isn't, it's not serving me or you for me to be part of the, the dynamic in the way that it plays out here. And so I am moving on. I'm not going to be doing that anymore. And that's a gift and a contribution to your own healing and to the healing of those around, even if they don't consciously get it but while it's occurring. They're setting an example of conscious behavior and i would add to that too um the fact that my my chiron is there opposing my 12th house um as part of the gifts that are that could be liberated i know come through the act of forgiveness there's that that forgiveness piece that will help me to be fully integrated and use those chironic gifts um in the areas around my third house or my sorry between uh my south node and the third house and i'm just now learning a lot more about what that that looks like it feels like the more i forgive around that south node to build themselves that i hadn't considered before yes and i want to, it's interesting you say that because just yesterday i had really a profound insight that forgiveness really is about at least initially, if not for a long time. Forgiveness really is about forgiving myself, deeply forgiving myself. And, and Sorry, I, I really wanted to hear what you're saying, but the audio got a little funky. I don't know if it was just for me. Do you mind repeating that last little part? Sure. I, just yesterday, I had a very profound insight, which is the root of real Forgiveness, at least initially, is forgiving myself for everything. 
Are you able to hear me? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's forgiving myself because anybody, you know, being as a child in a situation like that, it's, it's almost inevitable. The child picks up certain amounts of, I must somehow be responsible for some of what's going on here. And even as an adult where you go, no, well, that isn't true. I wasn't right about that. But there's remnants of this. Forgiving self that everything that occurred is something I had to go through was not my fault. Um, it, as, because I can't, the, what I started seeing was I can't really forgive anyone else any one iota more than I forgive myself. If I blame myself, I can't forgive somebody else without having some amount of blame subconsciously. In other words, as hard, as hard as it's been, it's all been necessary, not in any way a punishment and um, learning experiences and you survived them. And that's really important to recognize. You survived it. It was thrown at you and you survived it and you're in a good place. I get that a hundred percent. Was that good? Do you, is there anything else that you would like my, my opinion on? Um, not unless anything st jumps out to you. It seems like that you seem like you're really immersed in all of these energies around Chiron in such a beautiful way. I'm just wondering if there's anything that particularly lights up for you around that in my chart. And if not, that's okay too. Um, I think we've, I think we talked about it. You know, I, I mean, I get from just from what you, how you were speaking and what's important to you that healing, being a healer, so to speak. And I, to me, um, one can be an emotional healer. And not necessarily a body work or you know um, but to to be part of the healing on the planet as yes and i hear that you know your awareness of that and that's great that's awesome yeah but, one of the things that showed themselves recently around integrating it with my south node is is really understanding how it is that I'm healing this so that I can show and teach others. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that to me is, Karen, from the example of what you've been through and learned resolution or healing for, that is of value to other people who are struggling with similar issues. Because before you get to the healing, you don't really know how to deal with it. So for somebody that has walked through the fire and can say, well, here's what I did, or here's how it works for me, or try looking at it this way, I find that's extremely valuable for others that are in similar places. Thank you. You're welcome. I like the way they're changing so quickly. <laughs> um, Don, let's see, you were talking about, I've got it here, uh, Aries, Chiron, Skip Steps. I wanted to point out that both Don and Melanie have Chiron squaring the nodes, which I found interesting yeah. two in a row. Um, Let's see, I looked at this before. Okay, I want to say, in your, when I looked at your chart, briefly what I see is, well, not only do you have Chiron scoring the nodes, but to me, it is conjunct your Pluto polarity point. Yeah. Um, and I find that very significant. And uh, I... Also, that you are having uh, the Pluto transit, mm -hmm. <laughs> your uh, North Node, and let me see. I have your chart here. Just a sec. 
Yeah, Pluto was transiting between my North Node and my Ascendant. So and you're going to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have yeah. Pluto over Ascendant. I had that. Mine was in Sag, but mm -hmm. I had that. And um, that is that will be one, and you're, you're already in it, but that will be one of the hugest experiences you have in your life. Yeah. And especially because your North Node is essentially on your Ascendant. We're very right. close. And you are going to come from this. And now the reason I'm talking about that is because it's squaring the air, the uh, Chiron. So it's all part of it. All of that, those transits and the fact that it's on your Pluto polarity point is part of your healing and life purpose. The healing is going to occur from these experiences. Um, so they're all working together. The Pluto over your ascendant is a dramatic, um, you can call it a death rebirth of your sense of identity, who you are, uh, how you see yourself. And it's an extended process, which is, I don't know, somewhere between, and because your, your node is in it too. So for you, it's going to be like five years. And um, during that time, a huge amount of healing will occur. And that, I would say, if you can give yourself as much downtime as you can when you need it, in other words, when you feel exhausted um, and, you know, you'll have 17 good reasons why you can't be tired now. Uh, we all do. Right. Um, but <laughs> this, is, this is a transit that it's a huge gift and it's a lot because it's a fundamental transformation. You can look at it as an ego or personality um, breakdown. I didn't talk about it this time, but to me, part of the energetic changes that are going on on the planet are that we are moving. The planet has moved from what we call ego personality orientation into soul orientation. This, this has already occurred. The humans, we have, we are, some of us are in the process of catching up to the change. The change has already occurred. We're not, we're not trying to change the planet. The planet has changed. It's not trying to change us. It's just waiting for us to recognize it. This is a humongous, to me, this is a humongous experience for you because of the timing of when this is occurring. Um, of stepping into this other other state, the the uh, new agey kind of terms for it are three D reality and five D reality mm -hmm. consciousness, which is what EA calls soul awareness or soul consciousness. So our ego personality, it's not that we're going to die; they need to die, or we need to transcend it. It's that we have third. I don't know, 95% of us at least on this planet are pretty much self-identified as our personality. And that's not bad, it's just the way it is now. And we're moving into a state where we're gonna recognize ourselves as a as soul that is currently in a body and has an identity. And that there's a continuity or a continuum, in other words, yeah, I was born and yeah, I'm going to die, but I'm not really dying. I'm just kind of like going in the next room or the next vibratory frequency. Right. Like uh, uh, a good example I like for a metaphor is dogs hear sounds that we don't hear, right? They hear high pitched sounds we don't hear. We would say, there's nothing there, but the dog hears it. So something is there. So our soul or our higher self, our, our 
eternal reality is living in a frequency that we don't hear here. Well, we're, the energy is rising is, is allowing us to become more aware of our place in that greater picture. So, I mean, dying is dying and it's a powerful process, just like being born, but it's just kind of like, okay, so now I'm in the next room. And so the, the definition or the sense of identity, ego, personality is shifting. Instead of it being the ruler of everything, you know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm unrelated to anything or anyone else, you know, only my, only my family and my bloodline and all these other people here in other countries and all this, you know, they're, well, in the soul where we have the memory, not only that we're all one, but that there's this um, universal consciousness or force or a charge or spark. So out of all these transits, to me, with the timing of when you're going through them, this is going to, your sense of who you are, who you have been, is going to change greatly. You're not only going around, you're also going up. You're spiraling up. We're all spiraling up. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an accelerated experience that you're going to have. It's, it's going to raise your consciousness, raise your awareness. Um, what is, it's, a, it's a strenuous process. It, it, emotionally speaking, it's like a combination of first dying and then being reborn or giving birth. If you've had kids, you, right, you know what birth is. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's literally like rebirthing yourself. And, you know, most people when they're giving birth are not kind of out mowing the lawn at the same time. <laughs> In other words, it's intense. <laughs> um, and so during this period of time, when you feel exhausted, a big, a key piece for this is integration. Mm -hmm. um, we need to integrate the changes. We can go out and have some, you know, big ass spiritual outer dimensional experience, but that's not the point. And a lot of time it doesn't happen and it doesn't mean that anything's wrong or that the person is slacking off. It's just not what's needed in their process. But whether you're having that or not, you're going through the process that is like a gradual, instead of having an instant kaboom, you're having a gradual ah that's going on over a period of years. And it needs to be integrated. It's, it needs to be integrated into your life. It needs to be integrated into your family. If, you're, if you have a family, yeah. a partner, so yeah. you're going to be changing. And, I have a feeling that, yeah. <laughs> and they're, you know, they're like, what's going on with her? So... The more, the more that they, that you can help them understand as best to whatever degree they're able to understand that you're in this process. And because even the way that you view your life, your family, um, kids, and so forth is going to change. I say it's going to be better and deeper, but it's going to be different. And yeah. we expect each other to kind of show up more or less the same because in a consistency and you're going to be showing up different and so part of it is honoring that process for yourself that you're going to need more it will be healthy for you to have more downtime than you typically allow yourself and i mean a lot at times mm -hmm. like you know i'm barely Sometimes it's like I need to take a long nap this afternoon or I don't know if I'm getting up today. Yeah, I've been feeling that actually about three years ago, which I think was when Pluto first conjoined my North Node. Right. Um, I was diagnosed with adrenal fatigue. Yes. And it was crushing. It was like I up up until that point, I had no idea what was happening to my body, like what is wrong with me? Why do I have no energy? You know, I felt like I literally hit a brick wall and my whole spirit, my whole soul was in some kind of vice grip. And then I got the diagnosis and 
the um, the cure was to take as much downtime as possible, to sleep as much as possible. Yeah. And yeah. I tell you, that's been the best thing. And just yeah. being able to give myself the permission, and like I wouldn't give myself the permission to do that, but the doctor's orders, <laughs> you know, forced me into it. So, and I think that's kind of a symptom or a, I don't know, a manifestation of my Chiron Aries always trying to push through, push through, push through. Um, but so anyway, I find that interesting how I, I hadn't connected the Pluto polarity point um, and that transit being so integral in all of this healing journey that I'm currently on right now. So that's, that's very interesting. Um, right. I did have a question though about what you could relate about the skip step in, in all of this. I know in evolutionary astrology, when the, um, when there's a planet or point square to the nodes that it indicates a skip step. And I know that it would be resolved through that North node as far as my Chiron issues go. But um, what is your thought on that? Well, looking at, um, you know, South node in the sixth house in cancer, mm -hmm. this is kind of, you can see there where this is kind of like the dedicated mom. Mm -hmm. Cancer that has just by nature sacrifices herself for the good of the family. And um, that becomes not that habit typically is really ingrained and doesn't just stop with the family. I would say really that this is one of the major conditionings at this point in time of the feminine itself or the female of mm -hmm. learning uh, has gotten super duper good at serving and to the point of not being super duper good about serving self oneself and um, a way to look at it with the north node in the 12th house Capricorn is um, you're serving God or the whole mm -hmm. 12th house not only your family and you know the reminder is you're a part of that meaning it's almost the analogy I learned or metaphor I learned a long time ago is is um, when you're on the airplane and they're telling you about the oxygen masks, they tell you to put the mask on yourself before you put it on your kids. Um, and it's, it's a little, it's become a little trite, but the principle there is, is real. And so some of this is about taking back your own power. I would say with the Chiron and Aries that there's a wounding, because I see you have three planets in the first house. And in Aquarius, uh, two of them, they all? No, two. No, Jupiter's in Capricorn. And Venus in, in Aquarius. Mm -hmm. And you also, what is it? 12th, 11th, you have Mars in the 11th. Right. Um, so there's a lot of trauma associated with this, which is related to the wounding. Because the, the, the Aries relates, the Aries that current is in relates to the first house. And it's kind of like, there's like a fear, in a sense, from wounding to really own, own your full power. Having the south node in the sixth house, it's like there must be something wrong with that because I'm just supposed to serve. Um, and taking back my power is like, you I mean, I really get a say and I have a voice. And, um, you know, having it in the third house, you've, you've got a lot. That yeah. you know. Um, so that's what I would say is about real, realizing that it's okay for you to take care of yourself. Now, when, what I was talking about before about the sub, to, to the subconscious, what is familiar feels safe and what's not familiar doesn't feel safe. But these kind of placements, like taking time for yourself, um, 
tending to yourself could easily, I wouldn't be surprised if you had places in you that felt that that was selfish. Oh, absolutely. And, and it's, it's been a lifelong struggle. And one of the reasons why my ex-husband and I divorced and I mean, yeah, it just, it goes deep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. So. And, and that, that's a very good statement you just made because when we're taught, you want to know what is the skip step about mm -hmm. that goes deep. That's yeah. what the skip step is okay. about. And so seeing from that, the Aries and the Chiron represents the, the, the Mars energy, the impetus in you to take back your power. And for various reasons, you know, you may have been, um, well, look at what's going on even today to strong women and the way they're being treated mm -hmm. or being strong. So having had your share of that, it, it, you know, it, it, even if they're strong, it has a lasting effect. You're sensitive. Being told you're this, that, and the other thing. It's like, well, why do I want to go there? All I, you know, I, I just want to serve. And the way to look at it is that you're taking your power back is not about making it about you. It's about you become even more of a server because you're gonna be more trusting of your intuitions, the things that you are guided to do and say that you perhaps feel afraid or timid about at this point. Taking back your power, and it's step by step, there's nothing dramatically different you need to do. It's more like making it okay. And even if you do it in tiny little bite-sized nuggets, like one tiny little thing that you normally would say no or oh okay or go along with that you don't really feel like you want to just do it with little things to mm -hmm. start breaking the pattern because as you start getting familiar as your subconscious starts getting familiar that the new normal is i'm going to claim my power gradually that won't feel so scary it will start yeah. feeling normal Taking back your power doesn't mean having to turn into some, you know, like um, an angry woman kind of thing. It's just not about that at all. It's, it's, it's not going to another extreme. It's just, I have the right, I have the inherent right to feel what I feel, to know what I know, to have the wisdom that comes through me. And it's in a way my job or responsibility, that's Capricorn. North mm -hmm. Node. It's my job or responsibility to honor what God is putting through me. Okay? Twelfth house. You know, see what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. That makes total Chiron, sense. The Chiron is like the pivot point here. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. It's you have very valid reasons, whatever they are, that in your in your soul, in your psyche, for having developed that tendency in the first place. There's no judgment on it whatsoever. The just it, it, it has served you in some ways up until now, but it's increasingly not serving you, which is a sign of healing that has already occurred. You don't need that anymore. Hmm. So now you're moving to taking back the power. You can let it go. You can, you can let those parts of you go, the parts that are afraid, and you go, I have this, I can take care of you now. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. You're very welcome. Next. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Where's Diana? Diana, would you like to unmute and talk to Steve? I just like looking at the people. I think she's left the meeting. Oh, 
Yeah, I don't see her up here. Oh, you want to say something quickly about this and she can uh, listen to the recording? Um, sure, that's a good idea. Okay. Is there a question about it or just? No, it's her Venus conjunct Chiron, basically. And in the eighth house. Mm. So. So we have a 12th house Pluto right on the ascendant in the 12th house in Scorpio. And we have a south node in the 11th house, north node in the 5th house. So then we have a moon and Sag in the 1st house. Well, clearly we've had a lot of wounding around intimate relationships. So the, the point of this becomes what is the point, what is the, the purpose or value of intimate relationship? Um, so I'm being feel guided to say this. Most of us, especially when younger in this culture and most cultures, um, because we don't, we have, we have forgotten or haven't been taught how to love ourselves, tend to look outside of ourselves to be completed, to be loved by someone else, um, particularly relating to wounds of childhood. We got Mars in the fourth house. Um, and because of what we didn't get in childhood that we would have liked to have received in terms of love, we want to be loved. We haven't learned how to love ourselves. So we go around consciously or subconsciously trying to attract people into our lives that will give us the love that we feel we, not feel, we need, we really need. The paradox of it is that one finds out after a lot of painful experiences that nobody can truly love, give me the love that I need all the time consistently. In other words, they can't love me consistently the way that I would like to be loved. The only person that can do that is me. Now, as I learned, if you, when we're dealing with relationship with Scorpio and um, Eighth House, so we're dealing with a certain amount of compulsion and intensity, generally. So they can typically start that way and, uh, you know, hypnotic attractions. And we remember associated with Scorpio is uh, betrayal and abandonment and the fear thereof. And so these can become very painful experiences that start out, you know, like on fire and uh, <laughs> wind up either on fire or in the water. Um, and I would say the lesson there, and I am going to suggest here that the Chiron would be related to that. It's exactly on the Venus in the degree. And um, the lesson though in the 12th house is realizing over time the inner connection and that I first need to love myself. Um, as I learn to love myself and it becomes normal and ongoing, then my relationships are going to change, including intimate relationships. Now, it can also be, doesn't have to be waiting until one is like deeply healed, but um, it is to be forming relationship with partners that have a similar level of awareness and a simpler, similar desire to heal and to be willing to face 
the stuff that comes up while healing. So I would say that's, that is a lot of the intent of the Chiron Venus eighth house in this chart. Uh, Steve, Diane has re-entered the meeting and Diana, did you have something specific to ask Steve? I just got back in, I got to hear the last minute of it and I, I agree. And um, what I also attract, I'm very, very blessed uh, because I do have a, an amazing partner who's open, mature, humble enough. So we get to do a lot of the work together and it's been extremely healing. But what I also find in my experience is that I can tap into other people's pain, whether it be a couple, I, they're always like uh, come to me for advice, for, for words. And uh, it's interesting because I can always tap to it, but it's individual, you know, it's just a couple, but it leads you back to each individual and what they're working with. So that's something that uh, has been reoccurring for me is attracting couples um, with issues. Um. Let me know when you find some couples who don't have issues. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's almost like a, something that I've already been through, you know, that I'm able to provide help. Sure. In that sense. Well, something you're, that I can recognize is what I mean. I can tell from listening to you talk, you're an empath for starters. Um, you empath people emotionally. So, you feel it in your body, am I right? Oh, absolutely. And I can yeah. recognize it innately. Yes. So the, those are gifts that you have. And so you can look at it if you feel drawn in that way with the healing. I mean, that makes perfect sense. Part of your healing could well be to help the eighth house, Chiron, to help other couples in intimate relationships. Uh, and it would be through the process of what you have learned with your partner. And I want to say thank you for sharing about your partner. And that sounds awesome. And, uh, you know, that you can have a relationship like that is a sign where the two of you are within yourselves. It's awesome. And, yes, yeah, so your desire would be to help others. Uh, with what you have found, the process that you've been through towards towards healing. Mm -hmm. And that also, Chiron is the wounded healer. It also helps your healing. You, you helping other people helps heal you. One thing to really um, pay attention to is, is, as, an, as an empath is learning, especially with the 12th house Pluto, is learning the boundaries or borders so that you're not taking on uh, the stuff of people that you're working with. This is something to learn over time. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree with that. And yeah, I, I agree with what you said. And it's interesting because for me, it's even like a I went to, a, I had a hypnotherapy session last year, and uh, even the guy who was the hypnotherapist, he was just drawn to talk about relationships with me. You know what I mean? And we started talking, and he's like, I don't know why we started talking about this, but you held a big message for me just by sharing your experience, the experiences that you've been through. And it was interesting because it's like a give and take that person has a message for you and you have a message for them. And it's uh, so synchronistic and it's so natural. And I, I don't know, there's so magic in that, I feel. Yes, yes, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for your perspective. You're welcome. Let's, let's do another, Linda, I'm getting low on time. Oops, there it is. Della, please yes. unmute and go ahead with your question, thanks. My question Hello, is about Chiron in the 10th house. 
And I also have Saturn conjunct Black Moon Lilith in the second and around being a light worker and the stigma around charging money or having a career or actually being, you know, public in the world as a light worker. Good question. Yeah. What, what do you do now? I'm currently a garden teacher at elementary schools. I teach outdoor education. I do curriculum design and I study astrology. Are you working with people at all and like working with them? Um, no, but I study it a lot. I study sound healing with tuning forks, but I'm not necessarily working with people besides this EA Zoom meeting. This would be the closest. Okay. Um, I, when you feel you're ready to begin just a little, I'm, I'm all into gentle, small steps. I suggest you start doing some stuff, even as a volunteer in, in the beginning, with people you know that might be interested in what you offer, what your light worker skills are. And just start. In the beginning, to build up a little confidence, um, if you don't want to charge anything whatsoever just do some for free after that you can go to by donation for a while donation is good because you're not deciding what you're telling essentially telling people pay me what the value you feel you received for what i did if you don't feel you got any value don't give me any money um Little by little by little. Over the long term, the way I would put it is, and as you, if you're moving to wanting to make that a more major part of your life, not just for the money you make, but because of what it fulfills in you, of your calling, just take it step by step and realize little by little the people that are showing up that want to work with you, you're not necessarily asking them to show up. I don't, I don't like self-promotion, marketing, this kind of stuff at all. Um, but I find a difference between that and simply making people aware that I exist. And that's what I would say to you. When you're ready, not, not one day before. However medium comes up to you to do it, you can begin to just let people know, hey, this is, I do this. If you're, and a little bit about what you do and what, what value it has for some of the people that you have already worked with if you're starting as a volunteer. Um, and just let them know you're there and realize that the people that are coming to you, you're not making them come, they're showing up. Something in what you write, something in how you address yourself is sparking something in that person that's going, hey, I want her, I wanna to talk to her. You know, you can go to, why me? Oh, that's okay. I say, why not you? In other words, if those of us that are light workers were called to serve certain people, it's kind of pre preordained, and they're going to show up, and you're the vehicle. And we all um, we all need to eat. We all need food, so. You know, you do a job at the school and you accept money for that, and it's kind of the same thing. Just be humble about what you're doing. That's what I say. Just be humble with it. And if, the, if you're called to that, it will come together. It will step by step come together, and you'll be able to serve and make your contribution. All right. Thank you, Della. Thank Great. you, Steve.
Oh, thank you, Steve. That was absolutely fantastic. I got so much out of that. Let's just take a minute to get some comments from the audience and some feedback. Let us know what you think. I absolutely love your holistic perspective. I really love that you brought your experience into all of it. And it was very like heartfelt. And I very much appreciate being around that energy. And thank you for that, Steve. You're very welcome. Thank you. I second Diana. The information about the skip steps was really useful. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. All right, Steve, thank you so much for a great presentation. Looking forward to your next one. Uh, we all got so much out of this. This is just amazing. Thank and, you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Would you all please thank Steve Wolfson? Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you so thank much, you, guys. Thank you, Steve. Oh, thank you, Linda, for hosting. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. This is a really beautiful talk. Thank you. Yeah, lots of wisdom. Thank you. <laughs> wow. You're very, very welcome.